Regarding Men, Episode 19, Men's Issues, A Trigger for Cambridge Students. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Paul Elam with A Voice for Men, and I am joined as always by my co-host of Regarding Men, Tom Golden. And you will also see on your screen now that Janice Fiamengo is missing in action. She had stuff to do, so we were fortunate enough to get Elizabeth Hobson to sit in for her for this week's uh, discussion. I first met Elizabeth um, back in the opening red pill screening in Norwich uh, in the UK and uh, found her to be very interesting and very interested in men's issues. And she's certainly proven that since then with a, quite a bit of work. Recently, along with Mike Buchanan of Justice for Men and Boys, Elizabeth spoke at Cambridge University uh, and had to end up speaking up over the protests of the uh, entitled crowd of brats that showed up to try to silence things. Um, and we wanted to bring that into a discussion about the difficulty of addressing men's issues and the things that happen. So we thought we'd start with a live upfront um, story told by Elizabeth about what happened when she was in, in Cambridge. So with that, we're just going to give you the floor. Say, I'll say welcome to you, Elizabeth. Um, and let's hear your story. What happened in Cambridge? Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'd like to give a very, you know, concise, condensed, in a nutshell, view of what happened both leading up um, during and after the event. Because I mean, it's a story that's still unfolding. Um, so Mike and I were due to be talking on the 24th of May. I was talking about the history of feminism and Mike was giving an overview of the ways in which men and boys are disadvantaged by the actions and the inactions of the state in the UK. And um, at some point, the feminists became aware of this. And so they m made up this open letter, which was sent to the vice chancellor, Stephen Coop. Um, and we haven't seen it all, but it included accusations that we had harassed Cambridge academics and students um, and that they and other people would be at, in physical danger if we were allowed to speak at the university. Um, and so that was originally when the news broke about that, it had been signed by over 300 people, um, students, academics, and alumni. And we wrote to the vice chancellor and said, these allegations are all entirely unfounded and we're happy to meet with you to discuss any concerns you might have. Uh, we never heard back, but a couple of days later, there was an article in The Guardian. The Guardian had picked up on the allegations um, and they'd got a quote from a representative of the university saying that unpopular speech is not grounds to ban speakers. And so the talks were going ahead, which was great. In response to this, the Cambridge Student Union voted unanimously to increase their efforts to lobby the university to change their minds, um, which I believe consisted of more efforts to get more signatures on this open letter, which ended up with over 500, I think it was 507 signatures at the last count. And they also disrupted a graduation ceremony the week before we were due to speak um, with the protest which was noisy and, you know, they all had signs saying things like, can I swear? I don't know. Can she fucking swear, Tom? Uh, <laughs> who fucking cares? <laughs> yeah, signs saying things like, fuck off, um, eruditely. And um, so in response to this, uh, the university came up with a compromise, which was to move us well, I mean, I don't know if they were compromising so much as it could have been quite a reasonable decision, to be honest, because apparently in the Alison Richards building, which is where the politics department is housed, 
there were people revising for exams and possibly also taking exams at the time that the speeches were due to happen in there. But they moved us to a building where we wouldn't disturb anyone or rather where the protesters wouldn't disturb anyone. Um, Yeah. Uh, And actually it was nearer to the pub that we were meeting at as well. So it worked out fine for us. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Um, Yeah. And so, you know, we fast forward to the day itself and Mike and I had put out a blog piece on Justice for Men and Boys website, uh, letting our supporters know which pub we were going to be meeting at so they could come along and talk to us before the event. And obviously some more nefarious kind of people read that blog post as well and so while we were sitting there I mean actually I got there significantly before Mike and there was this woman who she kept coming in we were sat in a back garden with gates out onto the street and this woman kept walking in and just having a look around and I was looking at her thinking there's something awry about you (laughs) <laughs> and you know the next time she walks in Mike sat there and she goes again and when she comes back she's got a milkshake Uh-oh. which throws all over him um and I mean there were actually two milkshakes thrown because there were two cups on the floor afterwards so yeah there was there were two milkshakes thrown so I don't know there were maybe three of them I think there was another person who actually threw a milkshake but I mean It's all on CCTV, which the police have. So that will come out at some point. Uh, But, you know, the other person that appears to have been with them is a photographer for their varsity student newspaper uh, who had his camera set up perfectly to take this action shot, you know, of the milkshake being thrown. Uh, Unfortunately, he managed to miss out Mike in it because Natty was sat just in front of him and so you can see Natty's back and then Mike's here and then you can see um, our cameraman who's sat next to him you can't actually see Mike so it's a bit of a failure considering all the (laughs) effort they went to get it right Um, and so you know then we had Natty's uh, famous chase or wonder Natty as we're now calling her Um, so she chased down, uh, the woman who had thrown the milkshake and managed to catch her by her bra straps, uh, which made me laugh. You know, I thought if she was a real (laughs) trash can on fire and she never would have been caught. Um, (laughs) that'll teach her to wear a bra. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, that's all. Good thing that female. Indeed, indeed. I mean, you know, when she caught her, it's all on film and there were kind of white knights coming into the rescue and the girls going, she won't let go of me. She won't let go of me. And the white knights are trying to intervene and Natty's going, she's just committed a crime. She's thrown a milkshake over my friend. I'm going to hold her here till the police come. Um, Unfortunately, at some point, a man walks past and he identifies himself as a philosophy lecturer from Cambridge University who knows this woman and he's trying to talk Natty into letting her go but he's also on his phone and shortly after he's on his phone like a few kind of friends of hers turn up and manage to like wrestle her away and they run away into university property um However, the guards on the door confirmed that they know her name and they gave it to the police. And the police have confirmed that they have her full name and they also have the first name of a man who was with them, um, who was wearing a Shea Guevara t-shirt. So Natty christened him Shea Guevara. Um, (laughs) And, you know, we might goes and gets cleaned up and we make our way to the venue. And we're we're milling around outside and we can't get into the building um, because the security tell us that Mike 
is not in there and we can't get through to Mike. It turns out Mike is in the building, but he's left his phone in the car. So I don't know what kind of lack of communication went on there, how that kind of happened. But we all ended up milling around outside the venue. And we're just kind of standing there chatting. And we see this crowd of maybe 30 or 40, uh, you know, radicals kind of uh, filing in down the bottom of where we're standing. And then this one woman walks up and stands between where I'm standing and the door. And I looked her in the eye and I said, you're going to block the entrance, aren't you? So I darted in quickly. And before I know it, I'm stuck between the door where we're not allowed to go in and all of the protesters. And they start singing their songs. So they're singing... There are many, many more of us than you, which was quite tuneful um, and interesting. And what else were they singing? You know, these kind of rhymes about power to the people and, you know, Cambridge University, can you hear us louder by the hour? Um, you know, I mean, this has all been caught on, um, on audio and bits of video. So maybe I'll slide over the links to you, Tom, and you can let the audience hear some of that. Um, and I mean, eventually, I managed to get in, and the other kind of attendees for the talk are escorted by security round to a back entrance. Um, there were some protesters who tried to get in. Um, some of them had booked tickets, uh, but we did not let them in because, you know, as far as we were concerned, it was clear that they didn't want the talks to go ahead. So had they been admitted into the building, it would have just been a case of them pulling fire alarms and this kind of nonsense, you know, which would not have been a good outcome for us because we wanted to deliver our talks. Um, you know, and then we give our talks to the backdrop of um, them. Well, they went quiet for maybe five minutes and then they came back and they had pots and pans that they were banging and they had um, some kind of, I think looking at the photos, there's a photo with someone with a loud hailer, which is I think where they got a siren kind of sound going. Um, and they were singing and they kept it up, you know, the full kind of, I think we were there for maybe two and a half hours and they kept it up the entire time. Mm. Um, and, you know, all of this nonsense, you know, from before and, you know, during the speeches and everything, throughout all of this, I kind of, felt sorry for them because you know I'm thinking these people are ideologically possessed you know and they're terrified um, of their identities you know as feminists being um, uh, threatened you know which is why they don't want us to talk um, and you know why they don't I mean, you know, I find it kind of amazing that students at, you know, ostensibly the finest university in the land aren't chomping at the bit to come and see someone who has a very different perspective to them so they can come and argue. You know, there's obviously some kind of fear there. Um, but as we were leaving we were directed um, a certain, to follow a certain path by the security. And somehow, I'm not quite sure how, two attendees, a father and his 16 year old son, managed to come into contact with the protesters. So one of the protesters, a kind of, you know, tall, well-built young man, um, approaches the 16 year old boy and you know the difference between a 16 year old boy and an 18 year old man is quite significant sometimes isn't it you know and this 16 year old boy he's been named he's called Matthew 
you know, he's not a big lad by any stretch of the imagination, you know, so he must have been quite intimidated when this man comes up and starts um, giving him the V's and shouting in his face, you know, harassing him. And so Matthew's father, John, says, you know, um, why do you think it's acceptable to harass a minor? At which point, you know, all of the protesters basically start harassing him. And then a young woman throws a liquid over him. And, you know, I'd like to make the point as well that at no point had either of them expressed any feelings either way on our talks. You know, their only crime was hearing us out. Um, and so, you know, with some footage has just come out. Um, a second, a second's worth of footage, which shows John pushing the woman who's thrown the drink over him away. And um, then, uh, you know, a lot of the protesters start pinning him down. They're throwing punches and kicks. And it was apparently only because a bystander pulled him out of the crowd that he managed to get away. You know, and I feel incredibly, incredibly upset about this. And, you know, perversely, even though objectively, I know I did nothing wrong. All I wanted to do was go and talk about some, you know, true things, you know, raise some awareness, uh, have a conversation. You know, I, I have feel guilty about this. And every time I talk to him, I just want to say I'm really sorry. And what amazes me is that the people who were responsible for it, not only don't feel guilty and aren't going, God, I'm really sorry. You know, we were um, hyped up in a mob and we lost control of our, you know, inhibitions and we shouldn't have done that. Not only do they not do that, but they're actually um, putting out there this narrative that John harassed and assaulted the protesters. You know, which is why this second long clip has come out, you know, and the clip, you know, that shows him pushing the girl away. It's like, it's a second long and there's no audio. And they're sending it to us saying, you know, look, this is J4MB's violent misogynistic supporters. And it's like, you know, we, we just keep saying, well, show us the three minutes before and the three minutes after with audio, please. So, yeah. Uh, and obviously the police are involved in several investigations um, regarding what happened on the day. And so hopefully they'll conclude as soon as possible and any criminals can be brought to justice. Do you think the police there are taking the matter seriously about the assaults? I would say they were fairly, they were not very useful on the day regarding Mike being assaulted with the milkshake. Um, they were not particularly useful um, when Natty called them, you know, and she had the woman in her custody Natty had her for an hour and a half and the police were like, yeah, yeah, we're coming, we're coming. And they never did. You know, they had ample, ample opportunity to come and um, pick up this criminal, you know, but they didn't. Um, the, I, I don't know, I don't know how much I can say about um, the investigation into what happened with John and Matthew he has told me, but I don't know if it's public knowledge or it will be. So I can't really say anything about that. But I mean, at this stage, it's really, a, we're waiting and waiting and seeing what transpires. You know, we've got investigators assigned the various cases and, um, you know, they've at least said you know, that they are 
they've said that they're taking it seriously and if we're wondering about anything to call up and find out so we will be <laughs> you don't sound totally convinced uh no i mean i i don't the impression i got of them on the day was not great and you know that's that's all i'll say really that's all i can say at the moment this is one more chapter in a very long story uh, a line of similar stories i mean i'm was thinking this takes me back to november of 2012 when warren farrell spoke at the university of toronto and there was violence and there was attempts to block the speech, to drown out the speech, to prevent people from getting in to seeing it, um, and move on to um, Paul Nathanson and Catherine Young speaking, um, oh, at Ryerson University, and all the chanting and the fire alarms pulled. And then in 2014, we had our first international conference on men's issues and had to change venues because of death threats. Um, and now in all of the international conferences on men's issues, one of the methods that we have to use is to withhold the name of the venue uh, till about a week or so before the event in order to protect the staff of the venues from harassment and from threats. Uh, because they were threatening, seriously in Detroit, they were threatening to kill random guests at the hotel and hotel employees. Uh, for allowing the speech. And then, of course, uh, the narrative from the media was that we were the violent ones, uh, that we were the ones making threats and, and making people unsafe. It's absolutely staggering. Of course, there was never a mention anywhere in the media of the death threats, and the, the regularity of this is pretty staggering. So I thought Elizabeth's story is a great centerpiece for discussion on you know, where we're at. And unfortunately, it's not good. It's not that much different than it was in 2012, despite the fact that we've persisted in refusing to be silenced. And we've, we've got another one coming up. And just, again, I'm going to make a plug for tickets right now. Uh, International Conference on Men's Issues coming up in August of this year. Elizabeth Hobson will be there. Uh, Mike Buchanan will be there representing Justice for Men and Boys, both of them. Uh, Tom and I will be there. Janice Fiamingo will be there. Um, Sargon of Akkad, uh, Count Dankula. I mean, there's a, a lot of people. Uh, Sargon of Akkad is Carl Benjamin, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know. Um, a lot of speakers pushing free speech, yet still, uh, the Honey Badgers who are hosting this year's conference are very reticent to let the name of the venue out uh, until just before the event. Uh, they'll tell people that it's close to the hotel and they have, this is not drama, folks. This is not created drama. It's very real. Um, Elizabeth, one of the things I wanted to address and get your thoughts on too, was that I agree totally with the idea that there's a tremendous amount of fear in the ideological feminist community of any dissent. They're terrified of it. Oh my God, you, you might make us think. You might make us rethink. Um, and we can't have that. But there's something else in here, too, and I think it's, um, and I'll throw this out there to you and Tom, I think part of the problem is evil. That there's, we're truly talking about real human evil along the lines of the people that would have burned your house down if you helped a runaway slave in the antebellum South in the United States. That there are people that feel that justified in their hatred. They really do believe that they're the ones on the moral high ground, even as they assault people, even as they intimidate them and bully them and break every canon of human decency that we ever use to express between human beings of tolerance. All this stuff is just thrown out the window and they're a bunch of thugs and bullies that feel justified. And that, in my country, I don't know about yours, Elizabeth, but that in my country comes from the political left. Uh, all this justification for violence and bullying and silencing of free speech, um, which is, I mean, the United States, 
probably above all other countries on the planet holds the First Amendment in high regard. The freedom of speech is a very big deal here, and they're trying desperately to stop it still. So I think part of the problem, while it's fear, it's also we're dealing with evil here, true evil. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't believe that these individuals are evil. I believe that they're terribly misguided and they're being nurtured into patterns of thinking that are entirely dysfunctional. Um, you know, so I've been reading The Coddling of the American Mind by um, John Haidt and uh, Greg, Greg Lukianov. And what they noticed was that the way that intersectional theory as it's being taught in universities, you know, and the activism is training students to think is the exact opposite way um, to, you know, it's, it's everything that therapists will try to stop people thinking, you know, and behaving and following those kind of patterns. Um, you know, so I've got the book here and we've got emotional reasoning, you know, letting your feelings guide your interpretation of reality, uh, catastrophizing, overgeneralizing, dichotomous thinking, mind reading, labeling, negative filtering, discounting positives and blaming. Um, but what they are doing is entirely evil. It's, yeah, it's a very scary time to be fighting for, you know, values that I would call liberal values, you know, classically liberal values, um, like free speech and freedom of thought and freedom of association and meritocracy and equality. Um, yeah, uh, you know, and it's scary both in terms of, well, what's going to happen to me and what's going to happen to people who want to come and be associated with me or even, you know, just hear what I have to say. Um, you know, and it's scary in terms of what's going to be, what sort of society are my children going to inherit and their children after them? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. It's bleak, isn't it? Yeah. And I mean, I would say, you know, I know you said that it hasn't got any better. And I'd say, you know, in the United States, it hasn't got any better. And, you know, I've been thinking about what happened at Berkeley when Milo went to talk, which I did. I actually didn't know quite how bad it was. It's in this book, the story, you know, people were beaten over the head with poles, like metal poles. People were really, you know, the broken bones really terrible things happened but I thought that we you know in Britain we weren't so bad we you know it wasn't so bad and I thought I I, rem I was thinking before the Cambridge event of this moment when Jacob Rees-Mogg the Conservative MP was given a speech and it was interrupted by some protesters and they were pretty hyped up and, you know, shouting and whatever. But he just calmly got down off his stage and walked down to talk to them. And afterwards, you know, people asked him, weren't you scared? And he said, oh, no, of course not. We're British. And I kind of thought that I thought, you know, whatever they do, it's not going to turn into violence. But it did. Yeah. So I think it's getting worse here. Yeah, you know, I I keep thinking about the book that Scott Peck wrote a long time ago about evil. And one of the things that always stuck with me from that book was evil always leaves chaos in its wake. You know, because he was talking about how do you differentiate behaviors? How do you see when one behavior is evil and one's not? And that was one of the things that he said was that evil leaves chaos in its wake. And look at what happened here with Elizabeth. I mean, that's chaos. Look at what happened with Warren. That's chaos. I mean, they're leaving chaos every place. And so I'd say, yeah, this is looking like evil to me. You know, mm -hmm. if you go by Peck, and I do, I think he's a smart guy. He had it nailed pretty well. 
I agree totally, Tom. And I mean, you look at that historically, every tyranny that we've ever experienced worldwide was led by dictators and juntas and other groups that firmly believed they were on the moral high ground. Yes. Uh, even as Hitler was sending Jews into extermination camps, they believed they were creating a better society. Right. They really believed this to their core. Right. Um, and in Manifest Destiny in the United States, as we wiped out indigenous people and um, took their land from them and, and, and robbed them of their language and their culture, we believed that this was the glorious right thing to do. We were rescuing them uh, from their own savagery. That was the mentality. Um, and this is no different. And it's getting really scary. It, it really is because, you know, the, the left, and again, I, not, I don't want to just politicize this because certainly people on the right are just as capable of evil as the left. There's no doubt about it. But right now in the, the political world, I see the evil emanating from the left. They want to not let us talk. They want to control us. They want to take our guns. They want to take our rights. They want to run the show, take our money, redistribute it to others. They want to erase our history, to tear down our statues and monuments, and to replace it all with an ideological pipe dream that will only have suffering as its legacy. Mm -hmm. um, and this has been proven over and over again throughout world history. And we're actually witnessing this happen right now. It, we might as well be living in 1936 Berlin. Yeah. Very, very sad. Yeah, and, and frightening. You know, sad and frightening. It's crazy. It's yeah, crazy I stuff. Think, I think, you know, you can frame it as a sort of battle between good and evil or maybe you know liberals and illiberals there's a um a quote from uh what's his name bill whittle from the right angle um he said that conservatism is the conservation of liberal values which i think is very accurate and yes. apt yes. for what's going on now um but also, you know, it's a struggle between individuals and collectivists. And, right. you know, individuals like the three of us and like, you know, Justice for Men and Boys supporters and the attendees at the talk, you know, we're all, we're all individuals who are individually responsible for our actions, you know, for the mob who met us there, you know, they are collectivists and they have this, you know, disindividuation, which they, you know, created a sense of through their chanting and their swaying and their making noise, you know, they created this electricity that allowed them to become part of a mob instead of autonomous individuals who are responsible for their actions and that can be really dangerous yes. and it was really dangerous yes i'd like to change things just a little bit and put in a plug for elizabeth's speech because her speech was really important for everyone to hear or see or read and it uh, it's one of the best summations of how feminism has taken hold that i've ever seen you know, she goes into the biology of it all. She goes into the socialization of it all. And it's well worth having a look at. So very good job, Elizabeth. Just beautiful stuff. And uh, it's important for people to be able to see that. And I also know that while you were giving your speech, people were yelling pots and pans and whatevers. And, and we'll run a little clip to show people what you were going through as you were doing that. So...
again, this is chaos. This is people leaving chaos in their wake. And you withstood the chaos. I mean, she was able to give the whole speech, you know, even though all this crap was going on. So, you know, again, I, I, my hat is off to you in admiration for well, I'm going to add some accolades onto that too. Put it on there, Paul. One of the the things that I've sometimes been frustrated by uh, with anti-feminists is the almost exclusive and narrow-minded focus on feminism as the problem. And what I appreciate about what Elizabeth has done in her speech is addressing gynocentrism, addressing problems, aspects like romantic chivalry in a historical context. Yes. Those are like the most critical in particularly, you know, the name of this discussion is regarding men. And if we want to have discussions regarding men, we must have these discussions about the historical context of romance, of matters like that, that are so powerful, even in, in men's daily lives now, and so destructive. Um, so my hand off to you, Elizabeth, for being one of the few anti-feminists that seems to get that this is about a lot more than critiquing feminism. Yes. Uh, that this is about critiquing our history and our, our ingrained behaviors as a species, our socialization and everything else that goes in to really contributing to these problems. Amen. It's great stuff. So watch the speech. Yeah, man. And one of the things that really caught my attention was, was it Catherine of Aquitaine? Was that her name? Eleanor. Uh, Eleanor. Eleanor. Oh, my gosh. You read the speech, you're going to want to go back and read some history, too, because it's fascinating and very, very telling. And yeah, well, I, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, all of that came from Peter Wright's work, yeah. stuff about Eleanor of Aquitaine and yeah. the chivalry. Um I think it's from gynocentrism, from um, feudalism to the modern Disney princess. That's it. That but all of his books are well worth reading. <laughs> yes. Uh, Peter probably single-handedly has done more to shape my thinking on gender than any person. Well, but just sort of a, like a tennis match between him and Alison Tiemann. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them have had a, a profound impact on the way I look at sexual politics and sexual power. Yes. Um, and this is sexual power is huge power. It, yep. It's absolutely massive, must be addressed, or we'll never discuss men's issues in any realistic way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now let's see now, you know, we have Elizabeth here, so we 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 may give her the honor uh, as our guest to decide who gets the Flying Puta Award. Good idea. Uh, uh, <laughs> Elizabeth, if you haven't seen the, the, the program, every week when we do this, we award a Flying Puta Award to some feminist or some other uh, for uh, contributing to the problems, and we also point out a humanitarian award. Um, so do yeah, you well, I mean, you know, there is, yeah, I can, I can do that, definitely. Um, it would be to a group of feminists in particular, I think this week, it would be to Justice for Women, who are a UK organisation you may or may not have heard of. And what they do is they identify women who've gone to prison for murdering their partners or husbands and they go in and coach them and you know agitate for them to be um set free on the basis of you know they've been victims of coercive control and domestic violence and they shouldn't be in there um so okay pussy pass for women but oh, justice, justice for women yeah. justice for women yeah but just this week, they've managed to get um, a woman called Sally Chan Ch Challen, Sally Challen, out of jail. Um, so she went down for murder, for hitting her husband over the head with a hammer 19 times after she found out he was having an affair. Um, she served nine years 
and then they managed to get her out on the basis that he had coercively controlled her um, he had humiliated her and controlled her finances and she had her sentence commuted to manslaughter and since she'd served nine years she was allowed to walk free God. how lovely so i think that's a well-deserved award yes that that sounds like a great pluto award to me too putting murderers on the street there's your feminist cause mm -hmm. folks <laughs> Jesus. so she will be flying through in no time okay. women, are, women for just there was there's another interesting um aside to that is that jess phillips who I, I imagine people might recognize her name she apparently cried tears of joy when she found out that sally channel challen was free that's all of course Oh, yes, Jess Phillips, uh, the, ooh, uh, ooh. the UK version of uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, um, who brought Mattress Girl with her to the State of the Union address. Uh, yeah, these are real winners. God, we could give out all kinds of awards. I, uh, Tom, I want to suggest that we give our humanitarian acknowledgement to uh, both Mike and Elizabeth for yes. their willingness to stand up to the um abuse and harassment of feminists in order to thing. try to further a dialogue of sanity yes. uh, both about and between the sexes amen which we really need yes i quite agree so salutes to you elizabeth That's and to you mike buchanan founder of justice for men and boys and the women who love them who works tirelessly yes it certainly does thank you very much you're very well. Off of mic too. Indeed. <laughs> and with that, we will be back next week with uh, Janice Fiamingo, hopefully, if she has completed her, she has many tasks, got very busy this week. Um, hopefully, she'll be free and we'll be back to uh, our regular programming. But uh, Elizabeth, it's been awesome having you here. Uh, Thank you very, very much. much enjoyed the discussion and very much a big fan here of your work. And appreciate what you're doing that makes two of us oh, um, my exactly goodness right. <laughs> i don't know what to say that's i feel very um moved coming from you two that's quite the compliment good it's lovely to be here it's quite well the honor deserved. well deserved indeed and with that uh i have to sign off saying come to icmi 19 in chicago illinois this august uh, it is the 16th, 17th, and 18th, I believe. Uh, also, buy my book. There's a link <laughs> below. <laughs> Men are good. Yes, they are. Join and our newsletter. Too. Yes, indeed. Join our newsletter. Yes. Link below. Take care, guys. And we'll see you. Bye-bye. <laughs>